Uh, Janine Windolf has her Master of Fine Arts Interdisciplinary Media Production and Indigenous Fine Arts. She is the cur Curator of Community Engagement at Mackenzie Art Gallery. She is an interdisciplinary artist working as an educator, filmmaker, and storyteller. Janine is also known to teach beading, visual arts, photography, filmmaking, writing, storytelling, and indigenous symbols through schools, library, and nonprofits. Janine is vice chair of Common Wheel and chair of Reconciliation Regina. Please welcome Janine Windolf to lead us in learning and conversation on the meaning of reconciliation and our journey with indigenous peoples. Well, thank you for inviting me today. Um, I appreciate Jenna's recommendation to be here with you guys on this lovely afternoon. Um, well, the topic that they told me is a very personal topic. I myself am Indigenous. The more I learned about my family history, the more I realized how diverse my identity really is. Uh, part of my story is my family comes from Waswanapi, Quebec. We're part of the James Bay Agreement and the Tikamak Cree peoples from that area. Part of my journey into learning about my identity has been because I've been looking towards where home is and what my identity is. Today we hear a lot about murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls and that is a topic that hits me personally, but not in the way many people often hear the story. My family's story is we were the missing link, and that's how we came to Saskatchewan. My grandmother, Caroline, who is a Tikamak Cree, she was of residential school, and same with her husband. Part of my background is storytelling, so I want to share my story because I think that'll help you understand why I do the work that I do and how I came to be here in Regina. So going back to my grandmother, who was the one who taught me storytelling, who taught me how to practice my teachings that she was able to bring, but her story was often marred by silence and mystery. So living in La Ronge, which was where I grew up and was born, I would often hear that my grandmother was an outsider and a different kind of Cree. I didn't quite understand what that meant because I'm partially woodland Cree through my dad's side because we set roots there. As I started to ask more questions, I noticed that not too many people wanted to speak of that history and how we came to be. So after asking a lot of questions, I finally started to get some answers, but that answer to her journey came through my own birth certificate. I grew up and my name was Janine Otter. That was the name that I grew up with until I was 17 years old. I got my birth certificate and that's where Janine Windolph was found. That kind of gave me the first clue I had to figure out who I am and where my family comes from. My grandfather, Heinz Windolf, was from Germany, and he was living out east, and he ran in, well, he connected with my grandmother, but I never understood how they really connected, because you always want to hear that story of how a union comes together. And so when I was asking questions, my mom started to speak more and more about her mom's history, which it's not very easy for Indigenous people to talk about our history and have it understood, so they didn't speak too much about their past. But my grandmother was married to someone who was also from residential school legacy. And part of her story was domestic violence. And at that time, it wasn't spoken about when it comes to how women were talking about what abuse was. And so, it's a, it's a difficult story for me, so I just want to take a breath here. But my grandmother was hit in the head with an axe by her husband. The community at that time knew of the violence, but they didn't know quite how far he could go. 
Because of the trauma that was inflicted on him, he became an abuser his, himself. And so my grandmother was wandering through the forest, and that's where Heinz Windall found her. She was on the road, and he took her to the nearest hospital. And because my family is recognized in the community from uh, my great-grandfather was the chief for 28 years in Quebec, in Waswanapi. And so that was part of how he recognized her, but he took her to the nearest hospital, and from there, the hospital staff told him that if you don't take this woman away, she might not come back alive, because they've seen her repeatedly coming to uh, get healed from her injuries. And so that story in itself became what actually inspired my whole master's. It's called More Questions Than Ancestors. <laughs> yeah, and actually I, I don't feel like I know very much about my identity the more I ask questions, so it felt very appropriate and still is an ongoing journey even though I finished my master's. So as I learned more, my grandfather was a minor. He was a Nazi youth and he didn't talk about his history as well and that's why not too many people talked about him. But when I go to LaRange and ask about him, I was told he was a very good man that he had survival skills, he helped the community, he did the water well, he was able to support my grandmother and take her on this journey, but part of that impact of getting hit in the head with an ax was amnesia. As she started to remember, it was very difficult on her because she left two children in Quebec. When she tried to inquire about her children, the Indian agent there said, well, if you want to come back, you're going to have to get charged with abandonment. The best thing you can do is to stay away. So after that, she, got, she went through a deep depression. But by then, my mom, my uncle, and my auntie were born out of Thunder Bay, which was where they were staying. Unfortunately, my great-grandfather, Dion Blacksmith, spent every day of his life searching for my grandmother, thinking he was going to find a body in that forest. But here she was in La Ronge, Saskatchewan, where I grew up and was raised. And as I started to learn more about that story, it started to make me feel like I really didn't know anything about myself. I knew about the land I was living in. I learned how to fish. I learned how to forage. I learned how to speak woodland Cree. So I felt very connected to that side of my life. But the maternal line, is the line that we get a lot of our teachings from in indigenous culture. I felt my mom offered what she could, but there was a gap that was identified very early on because of that disconnection. So what my generation before me did was they called the community and asked if anybody knew who Caroline Windolf was, because nobody knew her as Caroline Blacksmith back in the day. So when they started asking, someone recognized the Windolf name and started to put the mystery together. And once they started to do that, they realized that Caroline Windolf was Caroline Blacksmith. And this was 23 years that she hadn't been in her community and that she was living in La Ronge. And as she started to face her past, because ultimately that's what she had to do to go back home. She, well, she drank so much that her liver almost gave out on her. So she did go back home because culturally we want to get buried where we were born. It's what we've always been taught. And she wanted to get buried with her family. So she did go back home. Unfortunately, her ex-husband thought that they were going to get back together when she showed up, which didn't happen. But there was a lot of conversations that happened along the way because this man ended up raising the two oldest children. And this person lived a very long life. The difficulty in that history was by wanting to reconnect with her two oldest children, she had to come to terms to, with her relationship with her ex-husband because these children were very endeared to their father who raised them. My auntie, who continues to give me teachings as well, 
So over the years, she actually lived six years past what they thought she would live. They told her she had four months to live when she left. She left six years, or lived six years, but unfortunately she was hit by a drunk driver. So in the end, it was alcohol related that killed her in the, that took her life. So now that left that gap, that grandparent gap that I didn't have. So that was why I really wanted to learn about my masters, like how to learn my identity, because I realized that even though I got my BFA and I attained a degree, I really didn't know anything, was what I walked away with. So my whole masters was coming up with how can I reclaim my identity, because now I have two sons and they don't, I don't want them to inherit that trauma and an unresolved story. So I took the time to understand Cree narrative storytelling, and that basically became an art form that I practice. I, I do film and video as well, but storytelling ingrains itself in a lot of the things that I do, whether it's my beadwork, whether it's curating at the McKenzie Art Gallery, the exhibitions are usually program related that I do. So a lot of the things come up with conversations. So after doing a lot of that work, I realized that I had to take care of myself personally because I needed some healing because I didn't escape the impacts of residential school. I went and was, well, it's difficult for me to say, but I did experience child sexual abuse as one of the intergenerational impacts that I was raised with, which did lead to teenage depression, which led to being suicidal, which led to attempting suicide as a teenager, which led to me talking to my mom about what I went through, because I realized that my trauma is an extension of the trauma that came before me. As I started to learn more about my family history, it actually really spoke to me personally that some of those behaviors, the silence, the lack of communication, the inability to make authentic relationships with the generation before, or before me was one of the hardest things because I can go and I can hug my son, I can hug both my sons, tell them I love them, and I do every single day because that was not given to me growing up. That was something that my mom struggled to do. I knew she loved me because she sure liked to cook and clean and do things for me. Those actions spoke a lot. But it was very difficult for those words to come out. And as she started telling me her story, she was residential school as well. And a lot of her story was running away from residential school. So she often tells people she's got a grade three education which is not true because she's got multiple degrees from the U of R here, so I think she's got to quit that story. <laughs> she's defining herself by that, but what I did learn was while she was running away from these schools, she was learning to hunt, she was learning to snare, she was learning to trap, she was relearning her traditional skills and that's how she was able to not get picked up by the truant officers, and so she told me a lot about that story, but what she realized was if she wants to be a good role model for me, she had to go to school. So she knew she can't continue skipping school. She did have me when she was 16, so she was still a kid when she had me. But she realized that she needed to make goals, so that's how her story came to coming to Saskatoon where she did her upgrading to where she came here to do her university degrees. She told me that the best way for us to heal is to focus on our education because the tool that was used to harm is the tool that can be used to heal. And I took that to heart and do a lot of work in education in my current field because I realized that that was essentially what saved her and it's saving me today because of my education. It's taken me on a really enriched journey which I want to share with you. So after I went through my personal healing journey, I did my masters, I explored that more questions than ancestors, but when I was done that, I realized that I started with myself, I moved to my family, 
but there was still more steps that I had to take to really support the ongoing healing that needs to be done as a collective. So I started to do statement gathering for the truth and reconciliation very early on. And through that, I heard hundreds of stories from intergenerational survivors, residential school survivors, staff working at the school, and different denominations of schools. So I have to admit, I'm, I was raised spiritual, so I know there's reverends and priests and all, but there was so many people that I started to learn more about the different stories and why people were coming into those tents. Because if you know anything about sharing your story, it's one thing to share it, but it's really intimate to also listen to a story. So we got put in these little canvas tents in these, like a room like this, but there'll be a ton of tents. And in there, that's where I lived through the whole experience of the TRC. But I, I didn't get to see the national events. I was pretty much bundled in my little tent. And through that, I actually met quite a bit of people. And I realized that there was a variety of experiences, some very traumatic, some surprisingly positive, which to me, learning the history, I wasn't expecting that element. So I realized that my job was not to put any judgment on anybody I'm listening to. My job was just to listen and to give that space for that person because they're there for a reason. And so if they're there to share whatever background they're sharing from, it's an important piece of the puzzle as we start to put this fragmented history so that we can understand it so we don't continue those cycles that can go throughout history. And that was part of what my mom told me was it takes three years to break a generation. It can take three years to heal a generation. She said, I am generation one. You're the second one, so what kind of life do you want your kids to live? And I took that to heart in the work that I'm doing, especially as I was listening to the TRC, because what I realized when I was doing that work is my family is not alone on this journey. My mom, unfortunately, because she started talking about residential school before the apology was labeled as crazy, I was told, don't listen to anything she says, there was no such thing as residential school abuse. And it was something that created a little bit of, I guess, anxiety as to, you know, what, where do I fit in that? Am I crazy? Is my experience reflective of her experience and my grandmother's experience? And I started to realize that at that time, that's why I had to finish my master's and that's why I had to continue the work that I was doing. So the TRC was, it opened my eyes on another level. And then when I did finish my role as a statement gatherer at the TRC, I returned home, which Regina is home for me. And one of the things that was left with me is what do I do now? Because I felt like we just opened up this, well, I don't want to say can of worms. It's not a good analogy, but we opened something up and we needed to basically heal the wound that we opened. How do we do that? And so that was one thing that in my personal practice as an artist, I, I kept that in mind with every project that I did. If I'm going to open a wound, I'm gonna find a way to help heal it. Not fix it, but help heal it to start that journey. So a lot of the stories that I do don't necessarily have perfect endings, but they do provide a path to how we can move forward as a family, as an individual, and as a community. And so one of the projects that came to my table was from a friend named Trudy Stewart. We were asked to do a documentary on the Regina Indian Industrial School. At the time, nobody really knew the history or talked about the history of the school. It was the United Church that wanted to create awareness also aware of their role as a Presbyterian church that they had in the school. And so we took that as an act of good faith in why they wanted to do the work because they said, just tell the story. We're not looking for editorial control. You need to do what you need to do and that story needs to come forward. So we were given 
a room, room to grow and to tell the story, but we realized the story was not the school. The story was the cemetery that was still on the land, that still had not been acknowledged. Nobody really recognized it as a cemetery. If you drove by, you wouldn't even know you just drove by that site. And so before I said yes, I told my friend Trudy, can we just go, can you show me where this site is? So we drove out to Pinky Road, and when I went there, the this, this space was very desolate and very unrecognizable. It was also winter, so it was full of snow, but even so, you couldn't tell that there was a cemetery there. It was lost, as the history felt it was lost. So, you know, we decided that, because we know in dealing with work that resolved, that addresses trauma, it's good for us to take self-care on that journey, to have cultural support, to not be afraid to, to see a counselor, which I had to do for a lot of the work that I've done, because you do have vicarious trauma as you're listening. And what I found was that there was no living generation who could tell me the story. So I had to work with the descendants. And a lot of the descendants were similar to my family in terms of Nobody talked about the history. I was able to understand the residual impacts. I was able to say, well, you know, my grandfather wouldn't talk about what happened there, but it wasn't good. That's all I know. I was told that people said, well, that was why he drank a lot, because, you know, he didn't come back the same. So I started to hear stories which were some of the cycles that I seen in residential school legacy in the work that I did with TRC. But this was first generation. These were individuals who were at that time willing to come to the school. There were a lot of the chief's children's coming because they felt that education was something that they did have to learn. But what they wanted was for them to understand that Western education that would help us survive, but they also wanted to keep their language and cultural ways because we do believe we can walk with those two worldviews together. And that was something that was important, but when the children were coming back and they weren't speaking their language, the biggest impact is, which not, I'm gonna have to declare, because there's two different people. There were some who actually supported the keeping of language in the first couple years. In the latter years, language was restricted, and then that became kind of common throughout residential school. But what was the most important, which I totally understand personally, was by not speaking their language, they couldn't speak to their grandparents. They couldn't speak to their great-grandparents because vocally there was no common language that they could speak. Right there was the first cut through that relationship, that kinship that defines indigenous identity. We call it Wakotawin, which is kinship. And that defines not only a nuclear family, that defines extended family values, but it also defines our relationships with non-Indigenous people. That kinship is how Indigenous worldview is, was visualized, was for us to come together and to have relationships with each other, to support each other. A lot of the stories we don't often hear is how people helped each other. So that was something that I wanted to keep in mind because I realized that while these, the systemat systematic policies that encouraged racist practices didn't necessarily sit in the hearts of the people that I was meeting. And so that in itself was made me very open to the work in reconciliation because not everybody was willing and open to s explore this journey of what reconciliation can look like. For myself, it's all about kinship. People ask me why I do the work that I do. It's because I've been able to build authentic relationships with the people around me and to make my friends become my family. And that cemetery, that journey of the cemetery and in getting protection for it, I met a lot of good friends who became key supporters, who became advocates, who became key figures in that journey, taking the responsibility to help find the truth, 
whatever that may be, and to continue sharing it. So we did have the documentary, but what was important going back to my masters was that we don't just have a video and throw it out there, that we have a video and we provide storytellers to help give more context to the video. So for myself, it's my personal journey. For my colleague, she was 60 Scoop, and her story is defined by the absence of a story with her family. For myself, it was fragmented ties, which I feel I work at healing every day. I would never say I'm healed today, but I would say I'm on a healing journey that started at 17. That's how I feel about my family, and that's how I also look at reconciliation is a larger healing journey together. And when I was doing the work of the cemetery, it was very difficult because we did have different perspectives of how things should be done because as indigenous people, each tribe are very diverse. We all have different protocols. We all look at the land in a different, well, in a good worldview, but we still see our practices in a different way in how we relate to the land. And so being respectful to the diversity within indigenous cultures was one of the hardest things that I had to navigate through because we were very different. And partly my way isn't always gonna be the way that I'm walking into a situation. So for the cemetery, if anyone doesn't know much about the Regina Indian Industrial School, it was opened in 1891 and closed in 1910. At the time, Saskatchewan wasn't a province. It was the Northwest Territories. And the tribes that were spread across the prairie provinces were the ones who provided students to this school. So that in itself is quite a diverse range of tribes that had a voice to contribute to this site. And so one of the first things when we gathered the uh, RISE First Nations Working Group <laughs> There's a whole journey, but that would take two hours, and I'm told I gotta to respect your time, so I'll, I'll sum it up for you. But part of that was this group felt that the best way was to create an open space where I, as a woodland, a Tickamook Cree, can come and pay respects to those children, as a Lakota person who has history can come, as a Blackfoot person can come and have that history, as a Soto person, as a Nishinaabe, whatever background that these descendants come from, we wanted to be respectful to whatever way they want to have their descendants respected. So that was something that was really important. So the creation of a nonprofit became the most logical step so that these wishes can become a mandate, objectives, and can have value. So the RISE Commemorative Association formed out of that and is continuing to do the work. We recently had a land swap and we now have Sarah Longman, who's the president of the organization, who I'm very excited will take the organization in a new, well, not new from our mandate, but has new light to offer the organization. I did that work for four years, but as I mentioned, self-care is super important. And in doing that work, I realized I also have two little guys who need a mom. So I took time to step back, but also to, to let other leadership come because part of being a leader in this field is to encourage other leaders to come up because we need more people speaking and willing to speak with audiences such as this group here and other groups about how to share that identity because I find a lot of people don't wanna do anything wrong so we hesitate to do anything at all. And you know, that's, I understand that because even as an indigenous person, I also make mistakes working with my own communities. So it's, if I can make mistakes, it's okay, it's all in the learning and what we do after. And so that was how I got to doing a lot of the work with that cemetery, but that actually led to my work with the Reconciliation Regina, which when the city accepted the calls to action as a municipal government, they started to gather what is now called the champions and these are different partnering organizations, nonprofits. Um, we've got elders, individuals, schools, 
and just different kind of ranges of community because those calls hit everything. We even have different levels of government involved. And we, while we did a lot of key events this year, just raising profile and trying to figure out who is doing what, because we don't have to reinvent the wheel over and over again. We can actually work with those who are already holding torches and support them as they hold those torches. So Reconciliation Regina has been now, it's a year as a nonprofit and it's early on in the work doing its strategic planning, still continuing those events and awareness, but we'll be moving forward as well. So I might have stepped off one board, but I found another board to be a part of. But that volunteerism is very ingrained in my heart. So I do believe that, you know, the more I can contribute to the community, the more I can put my head on the pillow at night and feel good about myself. Because at the end of the day, my kids are going to be raised in this generation. And the more work that I can do, the better they can do as young men going into the future. So I started to get them involved in my practice. So I just finished a film with the National Film Board called Stories Are In Our Bones. And I wanted to not talk about the trauma that my family experienced. It's been out there, it's in different films that anyone can, some of it's online if you Google it, but some of it you can find um, in different ways. But part of what I wanted to do with this film was to get my kids to learn how to fish, which sounds pretty simple, but that is an activity that my family in Quebec, in La Ronge, do. And I thought to myself, if I can continue giving them the skills that my ancestors and my family have, then they can carry that on to the next generation. Granted, I still let them play video games, because they're still kids, and I like video games too, but I want them to also know who they are, to balance the worlds just like I had hoped and am hoping to do. And so what I offer on my journey is my story. It's my family's story, and it's how those stories connect to community that become things like Rise Commemorative Association, Reconciliation Regina, and so on and so forth, because I'm sure with the way I'm going, more nonprofits can start. But at this point, I actually wanted to open up the floor to have conversations, to be able to, like you can ask me anything or you can share anything. Because part of it is this reciprocity of sharing with each other. I offer something of me, I welcome to hear from you, and I also welcome your questions. And I actually don't have a watch, so if I am going over, someone can give me a sign. I did. Okay, we got to be me. We got a sign person, so. <laughs> yeah, I want to open the floor up. Okay, does anyone have questions or comments for Janine? I think she's given us a very open invitation to ask anything. Okay, she did <laughs> tell us that it's okay to make mistakes. Yeah. She said she makes <laughs> mistakes. Microphone one. Thank you, Janine. That was um, very powerful, and I appreciate you sharing your story. I'm Dina Hinshaw. I'm from Edmonton, uh, the Alberta Synod of uh, the Church. And I, um, I wanted to ask, I was in a conversation in the last couple of months where someone said, you know, People say that uh, they want to be an ally uh, with Indigenous people, and, and this person said, you know what, I, I don't want allies, I want an accomplice. I want, if I'm going to rob a bank, I want you to drive the getaway car. I don't want someone who's just going to stand there clapping their hands. So <laughs> I guess, um, I don't know if that mm -hmm. comparison resonates or not, but I guess it, for me what that, um, that way of framing it said is, it's more than just cheering on good work, it's getting in there and getting your hands dirty to actually be a part of reconciliation. So I wonder if, if you have any thoughts or comments on um, maybe some of, you sounds like you've uh, done a lot of amazing things and perhaps had both allies and accomplices along the way and maybe if you could speak to 
what some of the actions are that you felt to be most powerful or helpful when it comes to non-Indigenous people who would like to actually be accomplices and um, commit themselves to the work? Yeah, no, that's a very important question. Thank you for that. Uh, a lot of the work I do has involved, and I actually don't use either of those words. I, they become family, because part of my goal is to create relationships. But I knew that early on, especially with the cemetery, that I didn't understand the paperwork that needed to be done. I also, because actually an elder told me that we need the paper to reflect what we're asking. And I'm a very good oral storyteller, but when it comes to filling out paperwork, it's not my strength, but also we needed to understand what it was we needed to do to get the land protected. So early on, we already had a group who were the ones who actually brought together the RISE First Nations Working Group. They were different fa faucets of groups, actually, who were keeping the history alive within the non-Indigenous communities here. And one of the first were trying to actually talk to what was the, Re the Regina uh, Municipal Designation Committee. We had uh, an individual called Keith Knox and a few other individuals who were keeping it on the agenda. But because they needed Indigenous leadership to really push that forward, it, it kind of sat on the table for quite a while until, well, until, I hate to say it, but until I said, okay, <laughs> I didn't voluntarily seek that position. I, it was asked of me. So, and that's what I was told was, you know, we knew about it, but we just needed someone who can work with individuals from the communities to do that work. But then we also had many people from different church groups who were translating the student list, who were doing research, who were flying around Canada trying to get whatever information they could. Those key information that they brought to the table that was shared with the RISE First Nations Working Group was super important because it was giving back history to the in Indigenous people who often didn't even know they were connected to the school, which actually was a big challenge of the film, was people didn't know they had a history here in Regina, so intimate. And so that was very important for getting and initiating these conversations when I first came to the table. And then as part of that, it's not reconciliation if it doesn't have two people working together. So what I found was by getting people working together as a group and having a goal, whether or not I knew we were gonna achieve the goal to protect the cemetery, I knew that in our meetings and the work we were doing, because I thought, what if we're all meeting and what if I fail? And that really still makes it, I'm happy we didn't, but it still made me feel like if I'm bringing these people together and we're doing all this stuff and we don't get protection, what did we do? Did we create awareness? But I realized, you know, they became very close to me. They, I started to get to know them. They started to get to know me. They started to get to know my kids. They got to know my dad. There was real relationships being built. And I thought at the end of the day, even if it's just that we understand each other and we tried, that's a gift in itself. And so when it came to that work, we did it together. So the accomplice is, is good as, that's you know, a role as well. But you know, every now and then, as an indigenous person, I get tired of always having to inform people of just basic stuff like I pay taxes. Not a lot of people know Indigenous people pay taxes. They think everything comes to us free, but that's not the case. So, you know, I participate in the Canadian system too. So that was something that was important because I was tired of hearing that. So one time, someone asked that, and before I could say, actually, it was an ally who spoke up and said, no, this is what they participate, they pay taxes, and started to explain even how the trust fund works for how 
in uh, how the reserves are paid and INAC, that they're different systems. So it's not taxpayers supporting Indigenous people. We had a trust fund set up, and it's the interest that gets distributed among the groups. It has nothing to do with taxes here. So this is happening, but we're also supporting this system as well. And you know what, for me to just sit back and to hear that, that told me that people are educating themselves and they're educating other people as well. And that's important too because it gets exhausting to always have to be the one to say this over and over again. So when we do have people who do that work and share, that's super important. And what I always told people when I would share Rise from Amnesia is take these conversations to your dinner table. Talk to your family about it. Because sometimes you'll realize that you know, that's where some of the work needs to take place. It was on my table at home. And once I started talking about it more with my family, the ones who were hesitant and silent were suddenly the most strongest supporters in my family. And then when it came to this group as well, if the community hadn't stepped up and did the work that they did that was supporting this committee's role, I don't think we would have gotten designation as easy as we have because it was the work of non-Indigenous people who supported the Indigenous agenda. I don't like that word. I gotta like get a like thesaurus here so I can feel comfortable <laughs> with my language. But it was important. And so in both those circumstances, that was very important to us. And then when we did Reconciliation Regina, we built it into the model. So we do have Chris Holden, who's a board member, who's also the city manager. As part of the goal, we're working with the city plan, community plan, so that they can take what they're learning and practically use it within the municipal. But we also separated it because we knew that reconciliation isn't going to be done in you know five years. It's going to take time, and it's going to take a lot of work. Some are a little bit easier to reach at this point than others. Some are going to take a long time of self-exploration from both sides. Because even as Indigenous people, when people say, well, how come they're not at the table with us if they care? Because I've heard that from a non-Indigenous person, and I had to remind them, many people are still dealing with intergenerational and residential school legacy. They're still healing. And if you think about Maslow's chart, you got to get the foundation taken care of, because how else can you move up there? And I've been very privileged to have a mom who takes care of those base needs and help me while I was having children. And, you know, her being a child herself, still being that role model, she helped me so that I can do this work that I'm doing, so that I know when I leave, my kids are fed, my house is taken care of, I'm not worried about disconnection bills, <laughs> those kind of things, because, you know, that's the reality of some of the things that happen because of residential school legacy is sometimes it's opportunity, sometimes it's education. Whatever it is, I have no judgment to anybody's journey and why they're not at the table. I just offer myself and I keep working with other Indigenous peoples so they can become leaders. Just like Jenna who would have been here, she's done a lot of work for the cemetery. She took people out on her own with Project of Heart. She did things that supported the larger goal. And if it wasn't for her, groups like her and individuals like her, we wouldn't have gotten as far as we did. So I also keep in mind that even though I'm up here as Janine, a lot of the work that I did was because of the community. And without that network, we wouldn't have achieved what we did. So non-Indigenous people are important in the journey and reconciliation. It's just understanding how and where we can support these conversations. And it's not easy, but I would say it just starts with having conversations and moving forward in whatever way and making mistakes and learning from them. But finding someone who can guide you is definitely important. I had my mom and she still guides me today, so that would be my best advice. Thank you. Microphone one. Thank you, uh, Anne Harding from Treaty 7 Territory in uh, Calgary, Alberta. 
Um, and just wanted to say thank you so much for sharing your story and for um, having the continued strength to, to share your stories with us. I work in my volunteer and professional life with Indigenous communities and um, really, really appreciate what you've shared and we'll offer a few uh, reflections um, that you shared. It's important to know that we can make mistakes and sometimes it's uncomfortable and, and that people don't want to step into that and, and I've often considered that to be um, sort of the paralysis of privilege that you know we have the privilege to to step back and watch and not want to make mistakes and 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 maybe we need to check that and just be okay stepping in and and asking questions and not being perfect um, and being willing to hear hear whatever comes back knowing that that might be uncomfortable too um, and also the conversation talking with with our families uh, my son just went through kindergarten this year and when he came home on orange shirt day and started explaining about it to me and about what they had done at school, it was uh, just a fantastic moment and that um, we're able to have those conversations with, with my five-year-old is, is really cool. Um, and what's been able to support that, I think, is also some age-appropriate books to talk to my son about residential school. Um, and so that's something that I'm, I'm interested in wondering from you, what your you know, two or three um, resources that you would recommend. I think absolutely relationship is, is what will make the difference and that's how we'll move forward together. Uh, I also think if we're going to not be paralyzed, we can take it upon ourselves to do that reading, to learn our own history so that that's not a burden that you should be teaching Canadians our own history. Um, so what, what couple of books or podcasts or documentaries um, would you recommend to, to folks that they can write down and, and take an action to go home and read? Oh, okay. Um, well, there's the there's actually a really good list that the Reconciliation Regina put together for their Regina reads. They're, those are very good and informative. Personally, what I really love is the Marrow Thieves, which is a more science fiction kind of more post-apocalyptic. But what I love about that book in particular is it reflects on legacy, but puts it in the future. And it shows that the pattern of residential school can come back if we're not careful, but it also goes through these personal experiences and it's geared to kind of, like I got my son who's in grade eight because I homeschool as well, and he's reading that one and able to understand in a more intimate way what the textbooks like National Crime, which I like that book as well, but it's very scholar and quite heavy, but very informative. So that one I would recommend, but what I always tell people what is my favorite is actually children's books. There's a lot of great children's books out there, even one about Orange Shirt Day. But the reason I like them is because they're, they are very intimate stories, but they're also very visual. And through that art and visual, you get a lot of understanding of indigenous identity, because a lot of things, and I'm bringing in my kind of background as an arts, but you can learn a lot through the symbols, through the patterns about a person's tribe, where they're from, um, like whether they say have, like up north we would put a lot of blueberries and cranberries in our beadwork because that's reflective of the land we're from. We have kind of more florals which relate to a lot of the Métis, so you start to see little intersections of influences of culture. When I come down here, you can see that the Soto people have a lot of kind of florals patterns as well in there, so you learn a lot about their identity. But then the Plains Cree are more into geometrics, which kind of relate to the Lakota people as well. And so I find those books have a lot of those visual identity that you can learn a lot about a culture. So you get the visual cues of culture, but you also get stories which are often drawn from indigenous storytelling and because when it comes to indigenous stories it's important to see them and I'm also reflecting on Marrow Thieves is because indigenous culture has always been adaptable to new tools and methods of sharing stories and to doing things so it wasn't very easily to hunt a buffalo back in the day, but when the horse came, it sure made life a little easier. So we adapted and that became part of the culture. What often I find difficult is when you 
position indigenous identity as a thing of the past. Because when you do that, then it's hard to connect to indigenous people today. And so, well, that's been something that's been important because as a filmmaker, the, the medium is very contemporary. So for myself, you know, it, it had a lot of conversations as to whether or not it was appropriate for telling indigenous stories. So that was what my whole master's explored. And so I would also recommend uh, Tasha Hubbard's film, um, We Will Stand. I don't have the Cree. It's a different kind of Cree than me, so. But uh, that's a great film for just understanding racial tensions. But I like that Tasha offered her personal story as a mother to humanize the story. And as an indigenous mother, that's something that's really spoke to me because I have two sons who are like little bears. They're very gentle, but you know, when I walk with them, they're getting glared at, they're like, they're just kids and they're, you know, they, they, they've they been raised as, well, Buddhas, <laughs> let's say that, but you know, I know they're gonna grow up and I'm gonna have to deal with some teenage stuff, but you know, I think the more important thing is finding those different mediums in whatever way, whether it's film, video, books, sometimes it's even video games. There's starting to be some indigenous video games out there. We're looking at that at the McKenzie as well. So I think it's just finding a variety of ways to engage in culture and find out who's doing that work. And you'll learn a lot about them, but you'll also learn about where they come from, their identity through the visual markers. So. <coughs> It's kind of hard because I'm, I'm so interdisciplinary than listing books, but I don't know. I love Sherry Farrell Reset's books. You learn a lot about the Métis people, especially the beadwork one. And yeah, I would take a look at that list. But honestly, I'm, because sometimes being indigenous, you live indigenous, it's, I, I, it's hard for me to always engage in that. So when I do find good books like that, like Marrow Thieves, I get really excited about it. And it's gonna be made into a film as well. But I think if we can find stuff that show indigenous people are present and still living is more important because some of those historical books time cast indigenous identity in a way that is actually harmful for people to see us as living peoples. And unfortunately, you see that a lot in places that speak of us in that way, like some national parks kind of start the history at one spot. But I think, you know, things are getting better. I find even in the school system, that's, I homeschooled them, so I was a little hesitant, obviously, but I'm starting to look at the curriculum and I've seen it improved quite a bit. And that's one book that they recommend as well for grade eight and nine. Thank you, hi, hi. Yeah. Microphone one. Thank you. Just actually, it's more of a response to the previous speaker's question in terms of resources from the things that you were listing. It reminded me of a, a massive open online course at the University of Alberta called Indigenous Canada that's created by the Department of Indigenous Studies at the University of Alberta. And so it's a series of weekly um, video clips that are put together over the course of three to four months. Uh, with discussion groups and it's if you want a certificate you can pay a low fee otherwise it's free so um, it's more of a suggestion for others I personally found it really helpful it's a uh, indigenous perspective on Canadian history trying to do some of that education that, that uh, I think you were referencing earlier that has um, a big burden to, to put on uh, the shoulders of indigenous people uh, individually time and time again. So it's a, if you Google University of Alberta, Indigenous Canada, massive open online course, it should pop up and it's like I say, free of charge. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for that. I'll have to check that out. That sounds wonderful. Yeah, I think part of it is building a discourse and starting to have more voices. With the cemetery, me and Trudy didn't want to be the sole authority on the Regina Indian Industrial School. So actually, all this project from Rise from Amnesia is on YouTube because it's accessible and free to use. Um, we also had other storytellers come forward and share. So there was a music video made, there was short films, 
there was this video series that we did that were from Spoken, and then we added pictures to help um, kind of give life to their, their voices. And then we did a lot of like just oral storytelling in person that if you come to those circles, you, you get a, a more expanded look at some of these personal histories that we often shared. So yeah, definitely, you know, there's more resources out there. That's another way too. Like, you know, Facebook isn't just for sharing what you ate for breakfast. Why don't you share a good book you read? <laughs> but I'm guilty. I always share what I cook. I love cooking. <laughs> Okay, Janine, on behalf of all of us here, I want to thank you so much for the generosity of your time, for your vulnerability of sharing your personal story, um, of your, the journey that you're on. It certainly opened my eyes in terms of some of the ways to move toward reconciliation through um, building relationships, through um, journeying with people, through not being afraid to make mistakes to ask questions, and really, really appreciate the time that you spent with us and your personal stories specifically, and no paper. You told all of that just speaking from your heart. So thank you so, so much for your time with us. You're welcome. Thank you.